Good afternoon. I'm Stuart Rosenthal, publisher of the Beacon Newspapers, and it's a pleasure to welcome you to our 15th Annual 50 Plus Expo. Thank you all for joining us today. This is our second year here at the Silver Spring Civic Center. I'm glad you could find it. Uh, it's sometimes a beautiful place to locate. And I hope you'll enjoy yourself today. If you haven't already, you will have a chance to visit all of our exhibitors and get your health screenings done. There's so much going on here today. This expo is presented every year by the Beacon Newspapers as a community service. I want to thank our sponsors whose support makes this free event possible. This year's sponsors include CBS Pharmacy, Comcast, AARP, Holy Cross Health, Care First Blue Cross Blue Shield, Montgomery Vascular Care, Casey Health Institute, the Jewish Council for the Aging, and Montgomery County. Our many other exhibitors also help make this event possible, so please thank all of our sponsors and exhibitors when you visit their booths for being here today. Uh, I've been stalling for time a little bit because uh, County Executive Ike Leggett is supposed to be here today to welcome you. Um, he said originally he was going to be here at 2, and then he said it might be closer to 2.15. It's now 2.20. So uh, unless he zips up the stairs any second, I think we'll just move on now to our keynote speaker. Dr. Robert Fischel is perhaps the world's most creative and prolific inventor of life-changing, life-saving medical devices. In 1962, he developed the first widely used rechargeable pacemaker. The device, implanted in heart disease sufferers, had lifetime batteries and was one-tenth the size of competing designs. He also invented the implantable insulin pump, which automatically delivers the appropriate dose of insulin to diabetics rather than requiring patients to check their blood sugar and inject themselves multiple times a day. In addition, Dr. Fischel devised the first flexible coronary stent, which opens clogged arteries in patients with heart disease. More than 10 million of these stents have been implanted in patients worldwide, making him known as the father of the stent, not to mention a wealthy man. He is also a generous man, having donated more than $30 million to his alma mater, the University of Maryland, to establish the Fischel Department of Bioengineering and its Institute of Biomedical Devices. All of this genius arose from humble beginnings. Bob grew up poor in the Bronx, the son of Jewish immigrants from Eastern Europe who were able to offer him little in the way of financial or emotional support. He graduated from Duke University in 1951 with a bachelor's degree in mechanical engineering. Two years later, he earned a master's degree in physics from the University of Maryland in College Park, which later awarded him an honorary doctorate. After graduation, he spent eight years as a civilian engineer for the Navy, then moved to the Johns Hopkins University Applied Physics Laboratory, where he worked for 32 years. There, as chief engineer and associate director of the Space Department, he helped devise some 50 satellites, including, are you ready? The Global Positioning Satellite, or GPS, now used on devices all over the world as a direction finder. And if it didn't help you find the veterans class here today because it doesn't do that very well, it's not his fault. <laughs> Uh, Dr. Michelle left the Hopkins lab in 1997 to devote all his time to inventing biomedical devices. He now holds more than 200 U.S. and foreign patents and has started up 10 medical device companies together with his three sons. Today, Bob will tell us more about some of these inventions, including his latest projects, any one of which would earn him a place in history. By the way, in 2005, he won the first TED Prize, awarded to an extraordinary individual with a creative and bold vision to spark global change and he gave a well-received TED lecture, which you can hear online on YouTube. We are fortunate indeed to have Bob here with us today in person to speak about biomedical engineering for humanity. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Robert Michel. Thank you. Thank you, Stuart, for that fine introduction. I'm sure my wife there enjoyed hearing it. My mother would have believed it. Um, I'm going to uh, tell you today about four new inventions uh, in the field of biomedical engineering that we hope will change the lives of many people. The first thing that I'm going to talk about is uh, coronary stents, why they're used and how uh, we made them better. Now this first drawing you see behind me is of a, of a heart, and heart has muscles that pump the blood. And to get those muscles to work, there are arteries and veins to do it. When an artery gets blocked in, a, in the muscle of the heart, it's called a heart attack. And that's a real problem. 
So as you, if you have too much McDonald's or other things like that, you get things called stenoses, or narrowing in the coronary arteries. So what happens then? They have devised means to try to fix it. And one way they said, oh, let's put a, a deflated balloon in, then we'll expand the balloon, and that will open it up, right? Well, let's try it. It's called balloon angioplasty. So what happened, in fact, was it didn't work all that well. Uh, then they said, let's try cutting it out. Let's try removing it. Let's see how that did. Then they said, okay, let's grind it out. So they did grinders. Then they said, aha, lasers, that has to be the cure for everything. Let's use, make a laser hole through the stenosis. And what was the result of all this? Well, here's the results that have actually been done by clinical trials. In, for balloon angioplasty, failed 55% of the time and within six months and the artery reclosed. And if you look at directional atherectomy, which is the mechanical removing of tissue, or lasers, <clears throat> or rotoblader, or any of these, on average, they failed half the time in six months. So we need a new invention, and that was stents. <clears throat> stents to save your life. The most successful medical device in history. Uh, I'm glad to say we've done about 20 million of my design in human subjects and probably another 30 million of, since the stent began about 20 years ago of other designs. So what does a stent do and how does it work and how did we make it better? Well, the first stents that were done were very stiff so that when you try to push it through an artery that curved, and if you look at a human heart, there's a lot of curvature in the arteries. So you want to get around a corner. And so uh, the, uh, they were failing to get it, and the early stents would fail nearly 50% of the time. So then we started improving, and we had a, our first, um, our best design that had come across was called the BX Velocity. BX stood for Balloon Expandable. I was pretty good at inventing, but I thought expanding began with an X. So that's why it was BX, Balloon Expandable. So uh, the BX velocity stent was a new concept in separating the parameters of strength and flexibility. So we wanted it to be strong when it opened up, but we wanted it to be able to go around a right angle bend. And the secret to it was in the design. And if you can see that drawing there, you see uh, that's what, to the right, is a cylindrical stent, expanded. And to the left shows what it would be if it were laid out. <clears throat> and the secret was, what, there are pieces that give you circumferential strength that open up like this, but they have to be connected together. And initially, they were just a solid piece of metal. But what I did was those little wiggles you see between. Do you all see the little wiggles? That was it. That's 20 million stents. Okay, see? So you'll see also there's not a lot to it. So uh, the here is an enlarged view. Here you see the wiggles. And we did one other thing. We coated it with a drug. The drug was called uh, rapamycin or sirolimus. But let's say the first name was rapamycin. And the reason it had that name was a pharmaceutical company went around the planet looking for things that could be useful drugs. In the soil on Easter Island in the Pacific, they found a molecule which when you put it on the stent prevents the artery from reclosing after you put the stent in. Now how's that? And the island is called uh, the gods there, the stone gods, are called Rapa Nui. So they named the drug Rapamycin in honor of the gods on Easter Island. So that doesn't happen all the time, but just shows what you can do if you're looking for 10,000 things around the world, that some of them are going to have some good value. So uh, it was this, this wiggle here that was invented by myself and my sons, 
which made STEMs flexible and for the first time really practical to put in people and open their arteries so that they don't get a heart attack. So here is some drawings of it. This, this was from our first experiments with pigs. Pig arteries, pig hearts are very similar to human hearts and it's the animal that we use for experiments. So on the left you see a control where we put in a stent and it expanded and you see growth around across those black cross sections of the stent wires. But when we used Seronis or Rapamycin, there was much less. And as a matter of fact, pigs weren't as good as humans. In humans it worked even better than in pigs. It doesn't always happen that way. So, the BX Velocity stent, instead of a 6 month, 6, six month, a 50% failure rate in 6 months, had about a 7% failure rate which is a dramatic improvement. So when you get one of our new stents with rapamycin on it and of the flexible design, there's a 93% there's a chance that it will, will never fail in your whole lifetime. Um, is there anybody in this room who has a stent? Can you raise a hand? One, two, thank you. Okay, three, no, oh, three. Okay, good. That's a little royalties. <laughs> so, I've decided there's four things I'm going to talk about today, and I decided to answer questions instead of waiting until the end, you'll forget about it. You had a great question on stents, but you forgot it by the time I was done talking. So, do we have any questions on stents? Yes, sir. Okay, so what's the translation from this great invention to the cardiologist? Now, are you, is the patient going to go into the cardiologist and say, listen, I saw this talk and I want you to use this stent on this particular stent, and how are the cardiologists going to react to that? Probably badly, because he knows everything there is. So how do you... Well, uh, I tell you what we do in our family. We study results on the internet. And we show those results to the cardiologist, and if he doesn't want to do that, we go to another cardiologist who will. And that's how my family would handle it. Is there any other questions? If not, I'm, I'm, uh, I'm sorry, yes ma'am. Speak up, please. Can you tell us name of cardiologist that uses this particular uh, Yes, I have a son, Dr. Tim Fischel. He's a brilliant intervention cardiologist. Besides, we can make some more money. Well, uh, uh, he works in downtown Kalamazoo, Michigan. Uh, it's a little far. Yes, uh, okay, yes, sir. Is uh, drug eluding stent the same as a rapamycin? Well, a rapamycin eluding stent is a drug eluding stent. Yes, that is the drug that's used on. One more question on stent. Yes, ma'am. You're hearing some controversy in the news media sometimes about using stents and, the re and uh, I, I'm not sure all of the ramifications, but sometimes people having a repeat heart attack. Can you talk a little bit about the latest research in using a stent versus not using it and what's the other alternatives? Well, um, <clears throat> there, was a, uh, there was some bad press about stents from a group in Sweden that wanted to publish some results. It turned out the following year they said what they had was entirely wrong. The bottom line is, stents are great, they have a remarkable difference. If that cardiologist says you need a stent, get the stent, it will save your life. So now... Oh, okay, sure. In the meantime, I'm going to pass around stents with... Um, here you'll see a stent that's before it's opened and after it's opened, and you, you can only see it with a magnifying glass. Otherwise, you won't be able to see it. So if you'd be good enough to pass it around here, then in back, pass it in back there, and we'll get around. There you go. And I want it back when you're done. <laughs> Don't swallow it. It's not going to go in the right place then. We're honored today with the presence of Montgomery County Executive Mike Leggett. As you probably know, he's now running for third term as our county's chief executive. He's been active in county government since 1986 when he first joined the county council. 
Not only has he always made an effort to attend our annual expos, he's made services to our county's older residents a cornerstone of his administration. And for that, we thank him, and we are glad to have him here today to say a few words. Thank you, Larry. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. A few years ago, when I was serving on the uh, county council, I had this request uh, from a group of residents in Montgomery County who said to me, you know, you need to invest more money in the county in illuminating uh, the signs on the road, making them either larger and much more reflective so that people can see it. When I looked at the request, I saw how much money it was. I said, boy, this is a huge, huge investment. Why, why should we go ahead and make this kind of investment now to make the signs a little bit larger and more reflective? Well, a couple months later, uh, I was driving near my home. It started to rain one night. <laughs> and I was trying to find an address. I sort of squirted my eyes to, to see the road sign. Well, I said, that was a wonderful idea. <laughs> <laughs> I went back the next day and realized we need to do that. I say that in all uh, humor uh, to suggest that in Montgomery County, we've tried to be as responsive as possible, even during the worst of the recession. We've placed a huge amount of money into our budget to increase transportation and to make it much more convenient for our seniors. My motto has always been treat our seniors with dignity and respect. And everything else will follow, providing the transportation, the housing. Uh, one of the more unique things that we are doing, right down the street here, new Silver Spring Library, adjacent attached to the library, will be affordable senior housing right there on the spot. And the reason why I mention that, this is right in the heart of Silver Spring, uh, some of the most valuable land that we have in Montgomery County. And in many other jurisdictions, they would not make that investment there. If they would place the housing in a faraway location, in some place where the land is cheaper, and turn that into a huge profit center for the county. My reaction was, we want seniors to have the enjoyment, the convenience of everyone else. And there are seniors who would love to live in an urban environment near many of the things that we have here in Silver Spring. And we're going to turn down all the requests from developers who wanted to make that into something far more profitable. And we're going to turn it into senior housing right here in the heart of Silver Spring. I say all of those things to say to you uh, that we continue to work with you and continue to look forward to having uh, your input. And uh, we have a real, real uh, asset in our community, and that is the Beacon newspaper. They have been so instrumental in so many different ways in providing a voice for our seniors. So let's give them a round of applause for what they do. And this expo is just now I say, and I had to start changing this a, a year or two ago. I said, to people would ask me, what are you going to do for the seniors? And I would constantly say, yeah, I'm going to do this for the seniors. For the and finally I realized, I'm one of them. <laughs> <laughs> and so I share in the challenges of trying to make sure that the lights are appropriate, making certain that we have all the convenience that we want, but making certain that the bottom line treat you with dignity and respect. Uh, having this expo, having this opportunity for you to learn and be more informed about things that may be helpful to you is just one reflection of that. And I wanted to come to somebody come here today and to acknowledge that. Thank you and have a wonderful program. Thank you. Thank you, County Executive, and to get on with medical gadgets. The next subject I'm going to talk about is epilepsy. Does how many people here in the room know have a family member or know of someone who has epilepsy? Quite a problem, isn't it? So epilepsy now is ten percent of all people will have a seizure in their lifetime. 1% of the population has epilepsy, 2.3 million Americans have the disorder, and of these, 
1.4 million have medication side effects and 700,000 have uncontrolled seizures. So for 2.1 million people, there's still a problem. The cost to the USA in the year 13, about $17 billion. So we started to work on this problem and we made a certain invention which I brought with me today and I will pass around. This invention is this machine right here. And the way that it works is as follows. And I'll pass it around so you can see it up close. Um, and it's big enough so you don't need a magnifying glass, that's the good news. So uh, the way you do it is the surgeon makes an incision in the scalp and pulls back the hair. Uh, pull, without even removing your hair, pulls back the scalp. Then, with a template, one inch by two inches, marks with a marking pen on your cranial bone the outline of the device. Then, with a dental burr, in less than five minutes, he removes that piece of bone. That piece of bone is just the thickness of our device. He then puts in a frame with four screws and snaps in this programmable digital computer. Didn't you always want to have a digital computer in your cranial bone? Okay. Then, he play, if you're, the source of your epilepsy is on surface, they will put in electrodes that have a flat, as you can see here, onto the top of your brain. If the problem, the origination of the epilepsy is deep in your brain, then we put in deep electrodes. And what this computer then does, it learns to recognize the electrical signal in your brain, which is the precursor of an epileptic seizure. It learns that, and that when it happens, it runs, puts its electric current through it, and turns it off so that the brain is reprogrammed to not have seizures. So let me show you some of the results. So the advantages of what we have is it detects and terminates seizures before clinical symptoms appear. It provides stimulation only when it's needed. It can be turned off if the seizures go away, as they have in some of our patients. It has minimal side effects. We get about a 1% infection, which can be fixed with uh, antibiotics. And it's an invisible cranial implant, so it's cosmetically perfect, so no one knows that you have any device within your body. So how, how have the results been? Well, of course, we had to do a clinical trial for, for your FDA. And these are the results. So we had to do, put it in patients and turn it on in half the patients, don't turn it on in others for a period of three months. So we began just by putting it in everyone and the effect of psychology is so strong that whether it was on or not, they had fewer seizures. But then we turned it uh, in one group, it wasn't turned on and the seizure rate within five months from the start went back to the original average seizure rate. But in those who was turned on, it got better and better. And then, as more time passed, it got still better. But then, as agreed to in the clinical trial, for those patients with whom it was not turned on, we turned it on, and you can see in red from the top point there that they started also to get much better and now they are much better. So how did we do compared to drugs used for epilepsy? So the top line is RNS, Responsive Neural Stimulation, and under it are all the drugs that are used and how long you went without having a seizure. And look how that single dot for ours showing that 15% of our patients were cured of epilepsy. With drugs, on two random trials, there was something a little better, but for the most part, they were not better at all. And not only did we get patients who were completely free of epileptic seizures, but most of our patients, 70%, started having fewer than 50% as many seizures per month. So in any case, it was a big improvement, and those people who had it really wanted to keep it. The top line that you see in this chart is our RNS after three years, 
90% of the patients said it's working for them. With the drugs, all the other lines you see, they didn't work nearly as well, and they were stopped using the drugs. So the good news is that the Neuropace RNS device was presented at a review panel selected by the FDA in February 22nd of 2013. The final vote of these ex -world, 13 world experts to the FDA as to what to do. And 13 said yes to zero, no, that no, the device is safe. In other words, 13 said yes to zero, no, the device is safe for human use. Then 12 yes and one abstention that it is an effective treatment for epilepsy. And 11 with two abstentions saying the FDA should promptly approve it. So what did the FDA do? Well, not too bad for the FDA. Eight months later, while um, two million Americans suffer with this, they finally said, okay, you can do it. So the usage in the U.S. is now surging upward because of FDA approval and reimbursement. L let me show this and then you can ask questions. We'll get to questions for everybody. At 29 states across the country, another experimental treatment is underway, using a pulse of electricity in the brain to stop a seizure in its tracks. 26-year-old Monica Lovelace is part of a clinical trial going on at California Pacific Medical Center in Is San Francisco. Yes, it does. Monica was diagnosed with epilepsy when she was five years old after contracting meningitis. She and her husband, Ben, have two young children, but her seizures make it hard for her to take care of them. Why did you decide to get this experimental procedure? Absolutely. For my kids. Absolutely. I, I wanted to be able to walk my kids to school. If I'm walking them to school and I have a seizure, you know, are they going to walk into the street? She's getting a device implanted in her brain that will detect the beginning of a seizure and give her a pulse of electrical stimulation to make it stop, like a pacemaker. Dr. Peter Weber, a neurosurgeon, uses a computer to calculate the safest route to implant electrodes in her brain. The wires come from the back forward, deep inside the brain, and that's the way they look from the front on view. Implanted in the skull, the NeuroPace device is smaller than a cell phone. When it's turned on, it immediately detects Monica's abnormal brain activity. These are abnormal discharges that lead to seizures. We followed up with Monica three months after the device was implanted. Now that you have this device in your brain, what happens when you feel a seizure is coming on? Can you explain it? It doesn't come on. Oh. Yeah, it doesn't come on. Monica still gets the familiar sensation that she's about to have a seizure, but now it usually stops. She showed us how she wirelessly downloads her brain waves. This goes over um, the area where the device is. The information is sent by computer to her doctor, who then fine-tunes the stimulation. While the device is still in the early stages, a preliminary study showed it helped 50% of people with seizures in the same region of the brain as Monica's. It's kind of neat because me and my husband were talking about all the different possibilities of what it can do now. Like, you know, maybe he had a job. Which I think is a very good idea for why. <laughs> I'd like to get it supported in my old age. So I'm getting to the questions. Okay, I'm an epilepsy. Yes, ma'am. How do you avoid getting this trauma this disease? What do you need to do? You mean to avoid getting epilepsy? Uh, be, ber have, be born from the right parents is the best advice, which may be a little late for you. Um, uh, avoid being having severe brain, uh, brain damage. Yes, sir. Ma'am. What about the screws and what they're made of, and how is that recharged, if ever? Okay. Uh, the, the device we have now is not rechargeable, but we're making one that is. The screws are made out of a 6-4 titanium alloy 
which has zero uh, corrosion in human bodies. Probably many millions of that uh, things with that metal have been used, and it's perfectly safe in a human body. Yes, sir. Uh, yes, it is. I think it's, um, until it's reimbursed, I think it's about $50,000 for the device and the surgery. Yes, sir. Is there any interest to make it smaller by using uh, new fabrication technology? Uh, its size is no problem whatsoever, because it's only one inch by two inches. You saw it maybe passed around, and I have a much bigger head than that, so it just fits in. Now, everybody does literally. I mean, the skull is so much larger. Size is not an issue there. Last question. I, I have no idea. I, I mean, the, the people who reimburse in America try to make it as slow as possible to save money, which is as hard on people as possible. So that's all I know about it. Okay, last question. That is a hell of a good question. Uh, uh, since I'm not a dog, I don't know the answer. <laughs> Uh, yes, there's a dog down there. I think it's a senile dog. Anyhow, so let me get on. So the next subject I'm going to discuss is another Fischel medical device. And this is implanted uh, in your heart, uh, in your chest, with a wire going into your heart. And it'll tell you you're having a heart attack before you have any symptoms and it saves your life. So let me tell you about the device from our company, Angel Medical Systems. So, let, uh, I don't know if you can read this, but let me show you the device. Here is the device, and I'll pass it around. Uh, this device here gets put uh, under the skin uh, of your left chest, and this device you have with you. Uh, this wire goes into your heart, goes into the bottom of the right ventricle, and it senses, this device has a computer, and it knows if you're having a heart attack. Before you know that you're having a heart attack, it causes this device to vibrate like your cell phone. It goes buzz, 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 buzz. This device makes that sound and flashes a light like that, and then you can get the hospital in so much better time that you will not die of a heart attack if you have this device. You're not getting it? No. Okay, it's about time these people had a little better treatment. <laughs> Come on, no, that's uh, people's rights on the left side. So, uh, if you can read this sign, it says that in the U.S. alone, there are one million new heart attack survivors each year, and another eight million cumulative heart attack survivors from previous years. The average time from the time you have a symptom till you get to the hospital is about six hours. Unfortunately, nearly 50% of heart attack patients don't even have a symptom. So this device is particularly valuable in them because it tells them they're having a heart attack. Despite decades of public education, from sim you have a symptom till you get to the door of the emergency room, that time remains unchanged. And to just sum up this slide, it, it, it's turning out that when you have our device in you, you get to the hospital in less than an hour, and the other people take, on average, more than 10 hours to get to the hospital with a heart attack. And by that time, your heart has been severely damaged. So, the Angel Med Guardian, the device I've sent around is called the Guardian, so we'd like to call the Guardian Angel, that's watching over you. It accurately detects coronary occlusion, which is a heart attack. It gets patients with occluded coronaries to the hospital faster. Alert pa it alerts patients who have no symptoms, and about 50% of all patients never have any symptoms, so they need this device to tell them to be treated. It notifies patients also of other medical conditions. We put in some other things in the computer, and it reduces the worry of knowing when your next heart attack will occur. One of the things that 
really ruins the life of people who've had a heart attack is worrying that the next one will do them in. With this device, that has changed. Because they say, oh, we have the angel med god in watching over us and it'll save our lives so I don't have to worry about it and the whole quality of life is improved. So, if you look at this chart, this green bar towards the, uh, towards the left there, that is the region where they can really save your life at the hospital. And that is the time frame that all of our patients get to the hospital in that short time. If you get a little further along, they do okay. But the survival rate is so low, if it's longer than that, that those are the majority of the people who die of a heart attack. So if you have this angel med device, the chance of you surviving any heart attack is dramatically better. So how does it work? And it's really very, it's really very simple. Uh, when you put electrodes on your body to measure your electrocardiogram, it's called an electrocardiogram. We call it an electrogram when we measure your heart's electrical signal within your heart. So this chart here is an electrogram. And you see that there's a, uh, what we call a Q wave, R, S, T, and P. I don't know why the doctors didn't use ABC, maybe they want to fool public people just so they can get more for their, your visit to them. But in any case, um, what happens when you're having a heart attack is that region of the electrogram from S to T gets higher. That's it, in 100% of the people, even if they have no symptoms. So that's what our computer detects. It knows what your ST elevation is normally, which is flat, and if it goes up, it warns you you're having a heart attack. So, we have first tried it on pigs. So let me show you the results. So uh, on the uppermost uh, chart there is a normal pig heart beating, but the one you should really look at is uh, the one in which you see ST elevation. Does anyone see it? Right there. You see it going up, and then a little bit later it gets worse, then you go into ventricular fibrillation and then, then the pig dies. So this is what happens with human beings as well. They get this shift of ST in the electrogram upward, which is what we measure. So then we tried it on human beings. I have a son, Tim Pichello, who's a cardiologist, who said, when I put the stent in you, instead of keeping your, uh, taking only 30 seconds to put it in, I'm going to take two minutes. And in that two minutes, I'm going to see what your ST rises as though you're having a heart attack. Because a balloon that's blocking a coronary artery is exactly like a heart attack. So my son Tim expanded the balloon for two minutes in humans with their permission and it does no damage for two minutes. And look at the ST elevation rising. Then he did it again, look at it. So there's no, there's no doubt that we have something, a signal that the computer can recognize and warn you, <coughs> excuse me, to get yourself to the hospital as quickly as possible. So these are the, this is what, how it looks in a pa patient. Here we see the device in the patient's chest. We see the wire in the heart. We see to the left, upper left, a, the device that has uh, an audio sound. If you have it on your night table, it'll wake you up. And then, of course, we have computers to control what's in you. So, we have had dramatic and statistically significant reduction in the median time to the emergency room for patients with positive tests. 51 minutes was the, uh, was the median detection time if you had it, and it was 1,808 minutes if you didn't. And as you'll see, I'll move on to the next thing, the cause of death, death rates increase by 7.5% for every 30 minutes you're late. So, if we look at the strong clinical benefits versus low risks, this is the seesaw we have. We have um, about one minute, excuse me, about um, from a, a, a one minute time to door from SD shift detection for alerted patients, uh, 51 minutes, excuse me, 
versus 30 hours for control patients. The thrombolytic coronary closure and progressive narrowing in the patients without symptoms. 122 patients had alerts for other confirmed illnesses using our device in the trial. 56% of the alerted patients had beta blocker dose adjustments to adjust their beta blocker treatment, and uh, it validated significant quality of life improvements. 92% of the patients said when they had it, their quality of the life was dramatically improved. So, what is AMA? What is the response to acute myocardial infarction, which is the big word for heart attack? What's the response today? You feel some chest pain or indigestion, it's not all that bad, and you decide not to do anything. Several hours pass and it gets worse. Finally, you go to the emergency room. You wait an hour as Burns and other critical patients are treated. They finally see you and it takes another hour to get your EKG and diagnose you've had a heart attack, which is hard because they have no baseline data. You see, we record baseline data in this device so they know what to compare it to. If you're lucky, you'll finally treat in three to four hours, typically ten hours, after the incident, but the heart muscle has died. So, how are we going to change it? The Angel Med Life Saving System. There you are, you see, with the cardioverta. So, you have a signal and an alarm and an electrogram. That gets sent to your external device. It then goes into a network operation center with a network operation support system. Then it goes to your patient database, because by your serial number we know who it is. Then it goes to a central place where, if you can see right on his screen, it says, this gentleman's having a heart attack. So then we call him and say, come out, come quickly to the hospital. There's the ambulance. The ambulance picks him up, brings him to the hospital. Then we call his doctor and say, Doctor, here's his, here's his electrogram. He's having a heart attack. You better get to the hospital. He gets to the hospital, and there's your doctor treating you at the hospital with one-tenth the time it took if you didn't have the device. So, AMI response in the future with our device. Before you feel some chest pain or indigestion, you feel a buzzing in your chest and your cell phone starts chirping at you. Your phone rings and it's the Angel Med Guardian Diagnostic Center telling you what's happening and that the emergency room has been summoned, the ambulance. The ambulance arrives, injects a thrombolytic prescribed by your personal doctor to dissolve the clock and prevent any damage to your heart because they know you've had a heart attack. They don't need any further diagnosis. The ambulance takes you to the hospital where you're, you're stent, uh, you are Stand straight to the cath, send straight to the cath lab, uh, an appropriate diagnosis and treatment, hope, hopefully with our stent. You're treated within 15 minutes after the incident and no heart muscle has died. So that's what we hope will be the future. So here is a little talk by my son Tim on what it might be like. So as an interventional cardiologist, uh, thinking about this device and what it could do, what we've seen it do already, we could have a very stark contrast, I think, uh, in the future between patients who are at risk of having heart attack um, with and without a guardian device. So if we take, for example, especially, say, elderly women who are at risk of having heart attacks and who often have atypical symptoms, then she might ignore her symptoms for hours, days, maybe even weeks. And then she ultimately has a big heart attack, doesn't recognize that, and comes into the emergency room very late, three or four hours into the heart attack, lucky enough that she didn't die, but is already going into what we call cardiogenic shock, her blood pressure is low. And by the time we get her in the cath lab, two hours later, she's even sicker. And we ultimately go in and put a stent in and open her artery. At this point, she may be so sick that she actually has to have a breathing tube put in and be sent to the coronary care unit and be in the hospital perhaps four or five days if she's lucky and end up with a large heart attack and a huge hospital bill. Or we can contrast that, let's say, the same woman who had an angel head device. She had known coronary disease, they put this thing in because she had a stent put in five years ago, and now three days before this big event was going to happen, she's having very modest symptoms, the alert goes off, and she calls 911, comes into the hospital, 
and they download the signal, seeing these significant changes in the electrogram in the heart, bring her to the cath lab, take a picture, and see a ruptured clot with some clot haziness. But she's fine, she's stable. I just put a wire down through there, put a stent in, inflate the stent, take it out, send her home that evening or the next morning at a very low cost. And she's lost no heart muscle cells. She's alive, healthy, able to go out, whatever, compared to the other patient who's still sitting in the coronary care unit, just having her breathing tube removed and hoping to survive, and then you know, having perhaps a million dollars worth of health care expenditures over the next 10 years dealing with this horrible, large index artifact. Okay, so much for heart attacks in my presentation questions. Uh, sir? Who would, who would not be a candidate for this device? Somebody who doesn't have the money to pay for it at this time. But actually, we don't have FDA approval yet. It's only been 14 years we're working on it. <laughs> it's only been approved in Europe for two years. Um, but we do, uh, we do expect FDA approval within about nine months, and then it will become available. That's, that's as much as I can say. So what that is, you don't have any symptoms of coronary problems or anything else? You wouldn't necessarily be Okay, ready. at this time, every one of our patients has already had a heart attack, and then they can have this device. That's 10 million Americans, that's a pretty good market there. But um, if you, are, say, have a family history of heart disease and what have you, and you already uh, have certain things that the cardiologist knows you're at risk, we hope someday the FDA would approve it for that. Yes, ma'am. I know somebody who wants an HMO to call up and said that she's having this problem. Why is she talking? They didn't tell her to come in, but she died. Could they have talked to her if she immediately got to a hospital? Yes. The death rate increases by 7.5% for every 30 minutes you come late after you've had a symptom. So, if you have some symptoms, don't ignore it. Go to, go to the emergency room. Yes, sir? So, so, what you're saying is, since it's not FDA approved, you can't really get this device in America. Correct. You cannot do that, right? Yeah. Now, if, if, if a person went to Europe where it is approved, could they get the operation in one of the Europe? Uh, yes, I believe that's possible. What are the, two, what are the countries that's approved? Uh, I, I don't know the answer to that. You'll have to send, uh, you'll have to inquire from the company Angel Medical, they're online. Yes, sir, the one far and back, and then I'll take the one in front of you. The ST elevation, is that technical with the ECG also? Uh, say that again. The ST elevation, is that also detectable through uh, ECG? Uh, yes, your, electro, uh, your electrocardiogram would also detect ST elevation, Se but, but it goes away one hour after the heart attack begins. So when you get to the emergency room, they say, oh, this person has a, hasn't had a heart attack, because it's more than an hour. The secondary question then is, can you, can you uh, develop a wearable technology where the sensor's on the outside and not inserted? Yes, that already exists. They're being pro uh, manufactured by a company in Israel, and that... Uh, if you think you're having a heart attack, you go home, you put this on, then you can send the thing over the telephone to your doctor. But compared to have it automatically inside you, it's a lot better. Yes, sir. I can't hear you. Can you prepare a stunt? Can you put it with a slow releasing blood thinners so that it doesn't recur again? Uh, one of the early patents we have is, if this goes off, we put in a, a drug in you that will dissolve the clock. That's already in a patent, so you're too late. <laughs> yes. Speak louder, please. When you do the experiment on this epileptic, epileptic uh, tool, you divided the patients into two groups. Uh, one group is supposed to on the mission when they have epilepsy. Other machine not, other group not supposed to on the machine when they develop epilepsy. Is that right? Yes. When we did the experiments with epilepsy, in one group we turned the device on, and the other group we did not turn it on for five months. Okay. Is it ethically right 
to instruct the patient not to have treatment when he has a disease? Uh, I can't make out what you said. See, one group, you advise them not to take treatment when they have disease, when they have epilepsy. Is there an ethical problem with not turning it on in someone who could um, uh, Well, the FDA causes us to have many ethical problems. For example, to not turn on our device, in, uh, we had to do our experiments with a heart device in nearly a thousand patients, not turn it on in 500 and count the dead because the FDA required it. I believe there's a lot of concern of us Americans about the ethics of what the FDA requires. Yes. Let us go on to the next subject, of course. Uh, the next subject is migraine headaches. 36 million U.S. migraine patients, 50 million migraine patients in Europe. The cost burden very high, a total of about $36 billion to treat migraine patients. And a majority of patients do not have a satisfactory treatment option. 70% of migraine patients are not satisfied with their current therapy. 60% do not get relief from the headache. If you're pregnant or have cardiovascular risk, you're not allowed to take the drugs to have your uh, migraine, and, and so on. And if you take the drugs, they have very serious side effects. So what we invented was a device, I have it somewhere, else. here it is. And I'll demonstrate the device for you. I think I'm loud enough for you to hear it. So here's a device to treat epilepsy. If you, excuse me, migraine, <laughs> what difference does it make? <laughs> okay, so you, <clears throat> once you press the on-off button, then you're going to be okay, all right? Because after that, it tells you what to do. So it now says, if you want a treatment, press this button. And now, <clears throat> if you can see, there's a bar filling up. There's a bar filling from white to black, okay? And when it's all done, it's going to go beep. And what it's doing is, it's putting electricity into these condensers, these big black things. And then when I press the button, it'll run 4,000 amperes through this coil. That's about 20 times what your house uses. And you'll get a magnetic pulse equivalent to a three-ton MRI machine for 160 microseconds. So let's listen for the beat. I hope some people at least close could hear the beep. And then now it says, there's a picture here, it says, put it on your head. Don't put it on your foot or your knee, because your headache's probably in your head. So what you do is you put it here, you press the button, and your migraine headache is erased. I'm not going to pass it around, because it's too delicate, and it wouldn't come back to me, because there's somebody here. <laughs> So our test results, uh, and by the way, the FDA uh, made us test it for patients not turned on or turned on, and we found that if it was turned on, we got a 40% to no pain at two hours, and about, oh, less than 20%, sometimes 7% placebo effect, where we didn't turn it on, but they still free of migraine. The placebo effect really exists. Then they said, for us, we have to test how well does it do at 24 hours and 48 hours. So we see that it was near 30% uh, treatment success at 24 hours and 27% at 48 hours. Then they said, because this device will go, be so valuable, it must exceed anything required of drugs, is what the FDA told us. So we must cure photophobia phonophobia, and nausea, each with a statistical probability of 95%. So in fact, we did great. We cured photophobia, sensitivity to light, phonophobia, sensitivity to sound, but with nausea, we had very few patients altogether who had nausea. So we only had a success rate of 88%. So the FDA said, therefore, this is not approvable in the United States. 
even though it completely cures migraine headaches. So uh, that, that began a long battle with the FDA, including showing them data from the neurologist which said that they're looking at something called the SNAE, S-N-A-E, which is a score for a sustained, pain-free, and no adverse events compared to drugs. And it's a combination of efficacy, how well does it work, and adverse effects. And our SNAE score was twice as good as the best drugs that there are, and drugs had terrible side effects. So, finally we got FDA clearance because we got them to say <coughs> that it's for nausea, we will be non-inferior to placebo. <coughs> that is, we won't be worse for nothing. That only took another three years. So now we have FDA clearance, but they would only clear it for use for migraine if you had an aura before. So, but patients with migraine with aura will soon be, can get treatment in the U.S. The clinical trials for obtaining FDA clearance for patients having migraine with or without aura is now underway by our company. It'll only cost about $10 million and take another 18 months. So that Americans, even though it's approved in Europe, if you want it, by the way, you can go to London and get it, uh, or many other places, and it works like it'll just eliminate your migraine headaches. So, let me put this up. So this was an early device in which we used pulses to treat migraine. You push a button and as you saw, this is an old device that she's using, not the one I just showed you. And it'll just erase your migraine headache. A powerful magnet tiny amount of current in the brain, and that'll eliminate your migraine. Okay. <coughs> uh, Carol Murphy uh, went into spasm when she has migraines. She can't even move. It's like a miracle, she says. That's what I like to hear from our patients. This offers hope. Not yet approved by the FDA. I want my life back, she's saying. So anyhow, so for the talk on Migraine has the question already asked was, what is an aura? An aura is a feeling that you get before a migraine. It is particularly flashing lights that begin in the middle of your vision. They get bigger and bigger and they go out, and that is the most common aura for migraine headaches. How many people in this room either have a migraine or know somebody who has migraine headaches? Big, good market. It's a good model. Yes, and uh, now uh, talk on migraine headaches. Time for a question. Are you saying that this machine actually takes away your migraine headaches? Yes. Is this been proven? What? Is this been proven? Yes. We did a test of about 200 patients, and we had a distinct success proving it's not a placebo. I mean, it sounds great, but if this were true, wouldn't it work? No, uh, actually, <laughs> actually, <laughs> one quick second. Those who are signed up for the AARP Tech class is beginning now. Um, sorry, there's like 24 of you all together. Yeah, they're all here, but you need to go downstairs for the class. Thank you. I mean, I, I look forward to saying it's true. I'm not, I'm just saying, if there was such 
such a breakthrough with that, you would think Dr. Oz would have heard about it and say, hey, there's something that might be coming out. No, we deliberately are avoiding letting him show it because it's not yet approved by the FDA for migraine without aura. We're doing those clinical trials now, and then we'll get it on Dr. Oz. But if you migraine with aura, which is 10 million Americans, yes, you can use it. And it will erase your migraine headaches, yes. I have the issue, so if FDA does not approve of it, your insurance will not pay for it, correct? Your insurance will not pay for it even if they do approve. Getting it paid for is an, an additional issue with reimbursement agencies who, oh yes, they are slow to reimburse even if it's FDA approved. So if, you, if they want, then if they don't have money, it's uh, It's very good to have money. <laughs> <laughs> yes, sir. Do your problems dealt with uh, heart problems and uh, arteries that are massively not kind of occluded, whatever. Is there any kind of like, it may not be your field, but it would be helpful. Is there any kind of foods or things that a person can eat through their life that can help keep these arteries? Oh, yes. There are things that make your blood not form clots that you can take. You see a cardiologist, they'll tell you what to do. And you know, nutritional things. Uh, I'm not an expert on nutrition. I'm sure there's five books on it, at least. Um, if there's no other questions, I'll just finish this talk. I have just a few more things. And, and these things are philosophy from a person who's worked for the last 45 years on medical devices trying to solve the engineering problems, the financial problems, the FDA problems, the reimbursement problems, I will, I will tell you, I will not recommend this field for any of you. <laughs> the difference between what is impossible and what's possible is often determined by the perseverance and un, uh, unrelenting desire to overcome obstacles and your drive to continue, even though some people have told you that it can't be done or it'll never work, which has often been told to me for each of the things I showed you. Some more philosophy. The most consistent attribute of the greatest inventions that have ever been made is that they were preceded by a constant series of disheartening failures, another subject of which I'm an expert. <laughs> and this is my last poetry, some poetic philosophy, which was written by a famous North Carolina poet named Robert Frost, who was in fact written for an uncle of mine who was a great surgeon, <clears throat> who loved his work. And what he wrote to him was, only when love and need are one, as it is for me, and work is play for mortal stakes, is the job ever really well done for heaven and the future's sake. And that's my last slide. Issue with the story about Bob on our cover. If you didn't see that issue, you can pick one up on the table on your way out.